What's happening, hardscapers? This is episode 21 of the How to Hardscape podcast, where we talk about how you can start and grow your hardscaping business. And today we are joined by Stanley Genetic. If you don't know who Stanley is, you need to get on YouTube and search him up right now and take a look at how to spell his name in this episode title. Get on YouTube, search him up, and watch his videos. He has been a real inspiration to myself and the landscaping community as a whole. He is here to talk with us about business growth and focusing on the profitability of your business. He offers so much amazing insight in this episode and you'll want to listen in multiple times. It is amazing to be getting some incredible guests on the show and it would mean the world to us here if you screenshotted this episode and shared it on your Instagram stories tagging Stanley Genetic on Instagram and letting him know that you listened in. And without further ado, here's our interview with Stanley Genetic. Today we are joined by Stanley Dirt Monkey Genetic. If you do not know him by now, you should. He produces a lot of great value for this industry and you should be tuned in to his YouTube channel and Instagram. Stanley, thank you so much for joining me here. No, dude, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. This is going to be awesome. Thank you so much. Stanley, can you give our audience, uh, most of which I'm sure already knows you by now, can you give our audience a little bit of a rundown about yourself and what you do? Oh, yeah, you bet. So um, I've been basically a contractor for 30 plus years. I mean, it's all I do. And I like to say I do it well. But uh, uh, so, you know, I've been in hardscaping, landscaping, demolition, excavating, running heavy equipment, also doing construction work. So jack of all trades, a little, you know, touching touching base in a lot of different industries that uh, deal with in the blue collar world. Absolutely. And you've got so many great videos uh, and so much value within this industry, construction industry, and, and you name it. And, uh, and your story is out there. So let, let's get into talking a little bit more about starting and growing a business. You know, what, what, what should people know about starting and growing a business within this industry? You know, Mike, one of the things I see a lot of guys doing is they get stuck. And what I, ca- what I call this, what I'd like to talk about today is what I call the graduation process. And it's almost like going through school. Running a business is a lot like starting in kindergarten because you really don't know what's going on, right? I mean, everything is brand new. You don't know paperwork. You don't know the processes. You don't even know how to do the installs a lot of times. And so running a business, even... Even if you've been inside of the industry, can be extremely daunting because it's an entirely new world out there. And so many new things besides the skills that you bring into the business. I know I talk about skills. I talk about the skills in your hands, your craftsmanship, your ability, your ambition, your drive. But that's li- literally just the beginning steps of running a business. And what I see a lot of guys doing is getting stuck and they don't even realize they're getting stuck. They think they're mastering their craft. They think they're mastering their business, but really what they're doing is they're hitting a plateau and instead of busting through it and just taking over, they stay inside of that plateau and then they, they finesse the numbers and they make small micro changes when really what they're striving for is those macro changes, the big ones, the ones that are going to take them to the next level. And that's what I want to talk about today is being able to identify those stages and then to break through those stages because that's really where things happen. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, starting with that plateau, when do you know that you are at that plateau? How many years might it take for you to really understand that you've hit this plateau and you need to take action to get to that next stage? So I want to challenge the guys and gals listening to think that they're always in a plateau. And the reason I say that is there's always the potential to grow beyond where you're currently at. Even if you are an accelerated rate of growth right now, there's always the ability to break beyond that. And when I say growth, I want to be very cautious because there's a lot of misnomers out there about, you know, 10x. And that's one of those pet peeves I have is contractors, they read the books, and they hear all these guys barfing out 10x, 10x this, blah, blah, blah. As contractors, we got to be very cautious about 10xing anything simply because our overhead is so astronomically high. If we want to 10x or grow our business, we've got to invest in people, we've got to invest in equipment, and sometimes our equipment 
doesn't cost a hundred dollars. Sometimes it costs ten thousand dollars. Sometimes new equipment costs a hundred thousand or two hundred fifty, three hundred thousand dollars to retrofit or outfit your company with a brand new crew that can go out and grow and expand. And so I want to caution guys about growing too fast, but I want to encourage them to continue to grow. And what I'm actually talking about is growth in a prosperous way. Grow your profits. Don't just grow for the sake of growing because that can lead to collapse. And I say this from absolute experience. I've lived through economic downturn after downturn, and some of my most absolute most profitable years have been the worst years in United States economic history. And what I'm actually talking about is those recessions, those dips where all of these companies are disappearing. There's a way that you can actually profit from even those stages. So I want guys to grow their profits, grow their net before they grow their gross. Once they've mastered their net, once they've mastered their profits, then start to focus on growing your growth. So whatever stage these guys are currently at, I'm going to challenge them to not take on more work, not take on bigger projects, not go bigger, bigger, bigger just for that sake, but to do the same work that they did the last year, but see if they can double their revenue. See what it takes to become hyper profitable. And once they've learned that, because there is, there's always a way to refine your business. There's always a way to take your business to the next step without adding extra expense. And that's by refining the processes, by improving the profitability on the jobs, by cutting down the time it takes to do those jobs, by creating a system so that when you go out and you look at a project, and then there's guys right now talking at me in the radio going, yeah, but I don't ever have any two jobs the same. Mm -mm. If that was true, then every single job you took on, you would need new tools. You would need new skills. You would need new guys. There's a lot of underlying relatability from one job to the next job, and that's what you've got to focus on. And then what you've got to learn to do is tweak the nuances of each job to improve your productivity on those projects. And once you start to understand that you can then almost take a look at all of the different jobs and projects that we take on as blue collar contractors, and then you can almost start to set and refine certain characteristics that are common, a common thread from one job to the next job. And when you find those common threads, you can then refine those and improve the profitability. And this is a huge, huge thing because it's not going to come like that. It's not going to be an instant thing. It's going to take season after season. A kind of an interesting question. I was talking with my project. Uh, I was talking with my co-owner of my company. I literally gave half my company to him. He deserved it. He earned it. Amazing individual. His name is Tim, but he's not as good of a manager as I was. And he asked me point blank. He's like, when did you start to really make money? And it, I said, I really started to make money, Tim, when I fired half of my crew in 2008. And, you know, he was part of there. He was in that business. But even being inside of it, he really wasn't taking the meat of what I was saying. And, and I, so I had to break it down a little further. It says, in 2007, we were doing, you know, millions of dollars a year. We had five plus crews running. And in 2008, before the economic downturn, I decided that I was going to fire half my guys. I was sick of the business, didn't want to have it anymore anyway. Why Why bust your butt just for the sake of busting your butt? There's got to be a better life out there. And so I made a radical move. And what my radical move was, was eliminating half of my guys and then cherry picking the best jobs. But on top of cherry picking the best jobs, by eliminating half of my guys, I freed up or doubled my own time, my, I doubled my own ability to pay attention to the existing projects that I was on, and then I looked at every single one of those projects and began refining the process to make those projects more profitable. And in the first year, it didn't make a huge difference, except for the fact that I did half of the work in the beginning of the recession and had the exact same profits that at the very first year of the recession that I had 
at the last year of the economic boom. So 2007 was like the last big year of the economic boom. My profits uh, were equal to the first year of the recession the following year, and even though I did half of the gross. Does that make sense at all, Michael? Yeah, that absolutely did, and it's it's this breath of fresh air that I'm hearing from you. Uh, in terms of, you know, there's this romanticism now of debt is good if, if it's, you know, going into equipment and uh, you're growing your business and, you know, take on these bigger projects. But, uh, you know, we've lived through this 10-plus years now of uh, good economic time, and we're well more than due for this downturn in the economy. And it's just a matter of time because this is what the economy does, up and down, up and down. And uh, it's just this breath of fresh air that you're providing our audience right now with this mindset well it history tends to repeat itself and so these guys should kind of go into these next few years being a little bit wary i don't want them to hold back but i want them to begin refining this process of improving their net without increasing their gross because what will happen is when they're able to improve their profit margin what's going to occur during the recession is they're going to be fine they're not going to over leverage their business. They're going to be one of those few companies that survive the recession. If, if a recession comes and if a recession doesn't come, who cares? You're learning to make more money doing less work. It's a very simple process, but it's not a process that's going to happen rapidly. Nothing good ever comes quick. I'm sure a lot of you guys and gals have heard that before. But what happens is it will take, well, for me at least, I'm going to share this with you. It took me three, four years before I was able to really start showing what I call massive projects. We took, I mean, here's an example, Michael. A lot of guys and gals out there running their business may be running at a 10 to 15% profit margin. And that's what I call barely getting by. That's not a good profit margin. It's just not healthy to bust your butt to give away 90% of everything you earned and to keep 10% for yourself? What the what? Why would you do that? I got my business to the point where I was making 50 to 60% profit margins. Now, here's how you got to do it. You've got to actually still market your company like you're twice as big, like you have twice as many people, like you have to pull in twice as much work. It's simple. You go out there and you bring in, you blanket your area, you take, you let the world know your doors are open and you're ready to take on work, 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 work. And people will start to come in. And then you know what you get to do? You get to say no. One of my favorite words. No, no, sorry, we're busy. No, we can't handle that. And then you start to raise your prices. You start to, the same job that you had did the year before, maybe you did it for $1,000. This year, you're going to do it for $1,200 or $1,300 or $1,500. And you're not going to gain as much. Your close ratio is going to go down, right? Your close ratio is how many jobs you look at versus how many jobs you land, if guys aren't aware of that. Um, so your close ratio will go down, but your profits will go up. What I'm trying to teach guys to do is to make more and work less. But to do that, you've got to have more fish coming into the net to do that. And then you throw the skinny fish away. You throw the diseased fish away. You throw the customers away that when you meet them, you don't get that warm, fuzzy feeling. When you get that feeling like, oh, this guy's going to be a piece of work to try to finish, you just either, A, raise your price and make it worth your own while because you know what? Nobody's going to look out for you as much as you are going to look out for you. And if you continually put your customer before you, what's going to happen is at the end of the year, you're going to be left behind. You're going to be the one with the empty sack. Your customer may have an amazing deal and amazing work, and you, my friend, are not going to have the profits to show for it. So put yourself first. When you get yourself into this point where you're just this big, fat, happy cow and you've got all of these amazing profits and money coming in, you're going to naturally, if you are a giving person, then do better work for your customers. When you are financially comfortable, you can then do more for your customers than when you are stressed, when you are aggravated when you feel like you are behind the gun, so to speak, 
That's not a comfortable position. And unfortunately, that relates to your work and your job. That relates to your customers. So charging your customers more is healthy for you. And it ultimately will give them better work, better results, and make them happier. They won't be happy about spending more money, but get a load of this. They could go spend less money with somebody else and be left holding the bag and getting really bad work. If a customer is not willing to spend more money to get better quality, then let them go get whatever they get, wherever they get. You pay what you get for. Absolutely. And I love this advice. And, you know, if you're saying yes to the, to one person, you're saying no to everyone else. So being able to cherry pick those jobs is so important and raising your rates as you talk about often. And what, how else can our, our contractors, how else can our audience squeeze that little bit more profit out of a job? What What else should they be looking at in each job to be able to improve? Overhead. They've got the very first thing that I want them to be aware of is overhead is the silent killer of the majority of blue collar businesses. The the failure rate inside blue collar contracting is almost 90 percent after five years. It's higher than almost any other industry. It's flipping scary to understand how many guys go out, just try to make a good living and fail after five years, and they work harder as a business owner than anything else. And the fa- the reason guys fail is because they're not taking overhead into consideration. Overhead, for at least me, was broken down on a day-by-day-by-day basis. And let me just give you an example of what my overhead, my real numbers were. I had to bring in running... So running 10 guys, and I think I was running about two to three crews on average when I started to be get, get hyper profitable, okay? I found that the three crews were my sweet spot for profitability without working like a dog. And I don't want to work hard. I mean, I love working. I work probably harder than anybody else, but I don't want to have to. I want to be able to make a ton of money without doing a ton of work. And so for me, those three crews was easy to manage easy to control all of the processes, and it was just one of those simple things that led me to better profits. But for my overhead, I had to hit $1,500 a day in completed work. Now, that's a scary, daunting number to a lot of guys. So if you're listening to this, it may be nothing. If you're running you know, 10 crews, that may be absolutely nothing. But for the average guy that's running two to three crews, For them to understand that if I don't make $1,500 today, I'm spending money. So no matter what happens inside my business, if I didn't make $1,500 that day, it cost me $1,500 to own that business. If I just shut my doors down, if it rained all day long and nobody went out to work on any projects whatsoever, that day cost me $1,500. And understanding that overhead is the first step to having a successful year because that will start to dictate all of your other processes and that's time management and systems management as well. So those are our business management systems as well. So those are important numbers to understand because it will start to drive all of your other processes. Absolutely. And any other steps or stages that you'd want to highlight for for contractors to understand further about, you know, growing their business? Well, uh, one of the things that I wish, like if I could go back fast backwards in time, right? Um, one of the things I wish I would have done a lot earlier was implement a more efficient office system because it gets to be almost too chaotic trying to control all of the, the pricing structure. So as guys grow, they're going to need to have a blanket system that they know if they hire an estimator, if they hire somebody to go out and do sales for them, how do they trust that they're getting the right numbers? That's a huge thing. They've got to either buy a system that does that for them or create a system that does that for them. Just recently, I took on and started to do uh, LMN. LMN is a very complex office system, but the more I'm learning about it, the more I wish I would have done it eons ago because it literally has taken all of my pricing structures and broke them down. Remember we talked earlier about the processes of being able to refine each system? Well, that's what this has done for my bidding and estimating. So when you guys, when you send somebody out to do your bidding and estimating or sales for you, they can punch in measurements. They can punch in the numbers, the dimensions of a job, and this will create 
a pricing structure that is equal from one project to the next project to the next project. Meaning if you have a guy named Steve bidding in your office and a guy named Sam bidding in your office and a guy named John bidding in your office, you don't have to worry about those three guys looking at one job and coming up with three different numbers. If all three guys go out and look at the same job and they're punching in the same dimensions or the same job specifications, they should all come up with the same number. And that's what this does. Think about trying to create that on your own. And that's something that I was doing early on in my business and I just wasn't having the highest level of success. So this is one of those things that hindsight's 2020. I wish I would have implemented something like that years ago. I just never had an opportunity to do. So that's something that these guys should be looking into as well. Absolutely. Systems, so important, and especially for that estimation process. And Stanley, I know you're a busy guy, and uh, you got a lot on the go, and we appreciate having you on the show today. Is there anything else that you'd want to leave our audience with? Every single day is an opportunity to learn. Every single day, also encourage your crews. Remember, these are guys and gals that are going out and trying to make you money. And the more you can encourage them, the more you can bring them in as a team member and not and make their work part of their life, make them feel valued. They're going to go a little bit further. They're going to work a little bit harder. They're going to do a little bit more for you. And every single day when you do that, that adds up to more success long term. I mean, every guy that ever comes into my company, I try to treat like I would want to be treated. And I think that's come a long way. So that's all I got for you, Michael. Awesome. Stanley, where can our audience find out more about yourself and tune in to your videos? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, on YouTube. So if you look up Stan the Dirt Monkey genetic on YouTube or just stay on the dirt monkey, I should come up. You'll be able to find me there or on Instagram as well. Easiest places to get a hold of me. Thank you for listening to today's podcast episode. Visit us at howtohardscape.com for more information. And once again, just one last time, if you haven't thought about doing so already, take a screenshot of this episode, share it in your Instagram stories, tag Stanley Genetic. Let them know that you listened in and anything that you took away from this. We love you guys listening in to these episodes coming out on the podcast. We're hoping to do even more frequent episodes in the future. And I've got a lot of great things planned for you. So thank you for listening in every single week. We look forward to meeting with you next week on the How to Hardscape podcast.